The Book of Luke Luke portrays Satan as a spiritual being and sometimes taking on a physical form. Satan was a real and dangerous enemy, not some kind of misbehaved comic book character which is often characterized today in much of the modern world. Even the Bible says he can transform himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Only a small majority of people today believe he is real. So he can do almost anything he wants with no backlash or response. But you know, I'm still continuously surprised how it is so easy that people will accept evil as good and good as evil. Thus saith Satan. Luke knew me to be as real as his fellow Christians. Most of the people today probably don't. All of Luke's stories are from his personal witness and from the people he interviewed. But Luke didn't have to interview me. He was already very familiar with my story. The apostles were warned about me by Jesus. Jesus constantly tormented and evicted my demons from the lives of many people. But you know, I'm still continuously surprised how it is so easy to get people to accept evil as good and good as evil. I shouldn't be that surprised though. It has always been fairly easy to cause that to happen in most of the times throughout history. In fact, most of the time it is so easy for me that I don't even count it as spiritual welfare. Huh. Throughout all of time, in all places, I have had my way in the lives of many people. But if you have read the Bible, however, you already know the times when I wasn't so easy for me. I didn't do so well in the Garden of Eden. That is until Eve listened to me and Adam listened to her. Also, Job proved me wrong, causing me a lot of frustrations. The first preacher, Noah, caused me a lot of trouble. Until that whole drunk episode. Remember that? Moses and David were most challenging too. Just when I thought I had them going my way, they would just repent and turn back to God. Huh. One time, the entire Jewish nation looked as if they were going to follow God. But that didn't last too long either. I rarely tell the truth, unless that is to deceive somebody. But here is a fact, my job has been so easy that I even sometimes give in to the temptation to get lazy. Few people have been able to stay faithful to God, even if I just put the mindless temptation in their way. They refuse to stay under the protection of God by being obedient and faithful to Him. And I can tell you from experience that even when God provides them a way out of temptation, not many choose to escape. You can probably see how I was drawn to miss the biggest threat to my work and the event that sealed my eventually doom. I'm still so angry about it that I go into rages and try to destroy everything and everyone that I can.
Time doesn't have a lot of meaning to me, but about 2,000 years ago, things were seemingly going my way. God and I had existed for countless eons on earth, and mankind was following a destructive path that I appreciated and was encouraging. On every continent, people were worshiping pagan gods or me, with the exceptions of the Jews, so direct knowledge of God was almost non-existent. Even to those few Jews, it seemed as if God had forgotten mankind. Frankly, it made sense to me that God would have given up on mankind. The world had gotten to where the intentions of most people were to do evil all the time. They either forgotten God, or ignored God, or couldn't even see Him in the nature of the magnificent world He had created. They seemed to have given up on God, and I thought God had given up on them. But I was badly mistaken. A young teen in a nowhere village in a nowhere country of Israel got pregnant out of wedlock, yet another sign that the Jewish God-focused culture was in decline, and I didn't even take notice when she didn't discard her baby in a trash heap or get an abortion like so many of the Roman women did. I didn't even take notice when her village chose not to stone her and her jilted fiancé chose to marry her anyway. Those were tiny details that seemed to make no difference at that time to me. You know, many pregnant teens have expressed innocence and can't believe they got pregnant. I figured she was lying just like the rest. The fact that the child grew up obeying his parents and loving God didn't distinguish him terribly from the other Jewish boys. In fact, I was more worried about that child's cousin, John. From the beginning, John called for people to repent of their sins and change their lives. That was cause for concern by me because once people understood they are sinning, Sometimes they choose to stop. Once people realize they were ignoring God, some choose to stop ignoring Him. The very fact that John could so easily bring these people to their senses made him a threat. So I put into motion a plan whereby the authorities would kill him. End of story. It was relatively simple to do because some people reacted so violently when they were brought to account for their own sins. It was only a short time before Harold had John's head huh, on a platter. By the time John was executed, I realized the biggest mistake of my long life because I had been focusing on John when I should have been focusing on Jesus. I watched John's disciples move over to Jesus. I saw Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and now recalled how Jesus' mother insisted that she had been miraculously impregnated by the Holy Spirit. I felt a fleeting speck of doom a feeling that was quick to intensify. Jesus was baptized, and then he went into the vast wilderness to prepare for his future by praying and fasting for 40 days. I knew he had supernatural powers and filled with the Holy Spirit, so I started harassing him and did not stop. At the end of 40 days, he was in a famished state. I gave him two challenges. One to change stone to bread, and the other to prove himself to be the Son of God. I knew he could easily change the stone into bread, and I knew he could resist that urge. But I didn't think he could resist the prideful act 
of proving himself to be the son of God. After all, his ancestors, David, was easily convinced by me to prove his independence from God by taking a sense. By refusing to be prideful, he was going to be a tough nut to crack. I decided to up the ante and see how humble he was. I took him in a vision to a high place where he could see all the kingdoms of the world. I literally offered him the kingship of all earthly kingdoms if he would worship me. And that was not an empty offer, and he knew it. I would have given him all those earthly kingdoms. But with one scripture quotation, he put me in my place. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. When Jesus didn't take up those two offers, I knew I had a worthy adversary on my hands and was not to be as easily deceived as I thought. I saw his reliance on scriptures to avoid the temptation, so I tried using scriptures on him. I took him to the Southwest Tower on the Temple Mount, which was the highest point. I challenged him to throw himself down so the angels could rescue him before he hit the ground. Not only would that prove he was the Son of God, but it would be done in front of thousands of people who would immediately begin to worship him. Once again, he refused to thwart God's long-term plan and quoted a scripture back to me. Thou shalt not tempt thy Lord thy God. That was so final that I left him to work on a different game plan. He resisted me and I had no choice but to flee to wait for a more opportune time. I tried to rule the earth through my deceptions and my temptation. Even though you Americans refuse to recognize that I am very powerful, but I am not all powerful. If I were, I would have known at the beginning of Jesus' ministry was the beginning of my end. The all-knowing God must have taken some satisfaction as he revealed my future to me over the next three years, a future that is still coming to pass. My doom began to be revealed immediately to me. Jesus began casting out demons out of people. Demons who had ruled people's lives by tormenting them and by lowering their resistance to temptation. Demons who have been able to get people to worship me, even to the point of killing their own babies. When I lost control of some of my demons, I knew what was in store, my end. Jesus preached over the next three years, and I began to understand how completely my defeat and demise would be. I panicked. I struggled to find a survival plan and came up with what I thought was a brilliant one. I decided to use God's people to destroy God's son. When Jesus was dead, all would go back to normal. It was simple to steer the religious leaders in hating Jesus. I fueled your self-righteousness 
and they harden their hearts. Even more damaging, I orchestrated opportunities for them to be embarrassed by Jesus in public. In a short period of time, they made plans to kill him. Once they intended to kill him, it was easy to get one of Jesus' own apostles to take the bait and betray him. Days later, Jesus was dead, and my troubles, I thought, was over. I defeated the God of the universe. I threw a party that no human could match. Now, I won't admit to a hangover, but I was in a bit of a daze when one of my demons gave me the bad news. God raised Jesus from the dead. I knew that I had actually aided God in his redemption plan for all mankind. I had fallen into his trap because of my pride. That was a horrible time for me, but it was going to get worse. Much worse. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he left his comforter, the Holy Spirit, and his spirit would enable his followers to have powers to resist me that I could not overcome. I knew I could not withstand the power of the Holy Spirit. But what I didn't foresee was how the Holy Spirit would weld His power through the church. Through the church. God had this secret weapon all planned and He sprung it on me. I was engulfed in a trap from which I could not escape. The church is the primary reason why I am ultimately be destroyed by Jesus. Well, I know my fate, which is to be cast into hell for an eternity, along with all my demons. That is going to happen. I cannot deny it. But before I go, I will do as much damage as I can to you and your family and your friends. I want as much company as I can get. You better realize this is not an empty threat. I am the ultimate enemy. I have tremendous powers of persuasion and temptation. However, even I cannot withstand God, and for some reason I cannot fathom why God is so patient and doesn't want any of His precious humans to perish, but wants everyone to come to repentance so they can be saved. This is, as one of my former victims Peter wrote, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire in the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything is to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people are you to be? You want to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming? My job is to keep you from living like that, not wanting to speed the day of my destruction. The good news, for me anyway, it's coming easier and easier to keep people from living holy and godly lives. 
I no longer do I use stone or wooden idols. My new strategy is just to eliminate the desire for people to be holy and godly. I don't need them to desire to be sinful and hateful. I just need them to be compliant and distracted. It's proving much easier than I expected. I started out with some simple entertainments, movie, magazines, etc. Those proved to be so successful that I moved on to more powerful distractions, traps if you will, the internet, video on demand, smartphones, social networks, etc. I just love it now that the average man spends hours a day just watching screens. Believe me, it's not the screens or the technology any more than the idols of the past were bad because they were wood or stone. It's the value placed on them by the people, the devotion, the attention, the time, the quality and quantity. That's what makes an idol. I'm making immense headway. Individuals are becoming isolated from each other. Families are being destroyed. Many people know they can be saved by calling on the name of the Lord, but fewer and fewer are even bothering because they are distracted by such unimportant things. I feel like I am back on a roll. I'm feeling good. But I still can't shake the sense of my very soon impending doom. Thus saith Satan. If this video caused you to question where you might live your eternity, please give us a call at 209-777-6513. Pastor Scott would love to talk to you about your future. This video was produced by the People of the Cross Church. Los Banos, California.